Western Reserve, it is 2021. Woo! I am so excited that the year is over. But more than that, I'm excited for a new year. I think one of the favorite things I have of walking with Christ in faith is that, you know, every day is new. Every day we get to experience his mercies like it's brand new again. And and while that's true of every day, I think there's something special about a new year that we kind of take a spiritual inventory, an inventory of our life, and and kind of what do we need to do to right the ship? What can we do so that this next coming year, I'm walking with Christ and I'm experiencing all that God has for me more than I ever have before? And, and before I move forward with the answer to that, or at least to start to unpack that a little bit, I got to be honest, I am not going to mourn over 2020 being gone, but nor am I going to celebrate that it's in the past. And here's what I mean by that. I think if we quickly, like it was a tough year, let's just be honest. It, it was tough financially, it was tough physically, it was tough spiritually, it was tough as a body, it just stunk. And, and if we look across our body and if we look across the family and friends, we know that it impacted us in different ways. But here's what I know. If we work so hard to get back to normal, we may miss what God had during that time. See, what I know about God is he uses these times to refine us, to grow us, to move us to new places. So if we quickly try to go back and we try to regain everything we had, I think we're going to miss that there's things and lessons he had for us in this moment that if we go right back to normal, that's probably not a normal he wanted for us. And one of my big things since this whole pandemic thing started is, what is God trying to do right now? And I think I'm starting to answer some of that in my life as I kind of take a step back and and do that spiritual inventory. So this is going to be one of those mornings where I'm just going to share a little piece of my heart of what God has shown me in my life. I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable, a little, very authentic, I guess, going into Pastor Jason's next message. And you might be like, Mickey, you're a pastor. How can you struggle in these ways? Come, I share a little bit of my struggle. And aren't you supposed to be some kind of spiritual rock star? No, no, man. I'm just a dude trying to follow Jesus the best I can. Um, he's called me to a special place to do that. I, I thank God he's called me here. But I'd be doing a disservice if I pretended that I have it all together, that, that every day is perfect. It's not. Just like all of you, there's days that are awesome, and there's days, man, I'm wondering how he even called me this to begin with. So as I took that spiritual inventory, as we go into the new year, and I look back at, at really what I personally experienced in 2020 and what I struggled with, what I found is I struggled with consistency. Like that consistent walk with Christ. The consistency of the disciplines that that lead to intimacy. My prayer life was all over the map. My study time was all over the map. Obviously, we know our time in community was so different. And so the consistent walk, see all the people and the environments and, and those type of things, that, those routines that I had built in my life to help maintain consistency, they weren't as available as they were in years prior. And, and while I could blame the pandemic, I could blame government's response, I could blame a variety of things to why those, those things that I had depended on have disrupted my consistency, the truth of the matter is that would be total excuse because God hasn't gone anywhere. God is available to me. The Father is is ready to embrace me now and be in relationship with me as much right now as he ever was. His word just is available. So really what the lesson then becomes is Maybe I was depending on environments and things and all this other stuff in my life more than I was in Christ himself. And that stings to admit. Like That hurts a little bit. Now, don't get me wrong. These things are good and they're meant for a purpose. But maybe, just maybe, these things have replaced or taken an unhealthy place of my direct relationship with him. 
and, and that's something, man, I'm, I'm struggling through. And so this, this message this morning is really you and me inviting you into really what I'm preaching to myself. Um, and and here's, here's the honest answer. If anyone knows me, I am an action-orientated guy. Like, I want to get after it. I want to do things. So my natural reaction when I catch that these areas of my life are inconsistent is basically to will it to happen. Like, I am going to do everything I can. I'm going to get up at 5 in the morning. I'm going to study my Bible. And I'm going to do these things. That I'm going to work harder than I've ever worked before to maintain these routines. I think you automatically start seeing that I'm even in my response to my inconsistency, I'm going right back to depending on myself to do it. This, this idea, and, and it's because I still live with this idea, I struggle with this every day of my life, that as much as theologically I know that I have to do nothing to earn the, God, earn the Father's favor, I don't have to do anything. I know that. My head knows that to be true. My heart knows that to be true. But my emotions and my flesh and this this human piece of me, it says that when I get off base, I need to do something to earn God's favor back. I need to do something to make that relationship right. And and so I, I go about all my service and all my prayer time and and my study time becomes not about being intimate with the Father, but about earning His relationship. And, And my fear is that I can start checking the right boxes, doing the right things with the completely wrong motivations. And that's scary. Now, don't get me wrong. These things will never return void. If you are spending daily time in the Word, if you are meeting with Him in prayer, even if it's out of a sense of duty, He's going to use that time. But what He's going to do is use that time to show you that you're going to reach the end of yourself and at some point you're going to realize that those actions aren't enough. See, if we continue down that road of just trying to do these things, trying to will these spiritual disciplines to happen, we end up exhausted, defeated, frustrated. And when we continue these things, even in in that spirit, what happens is that becomes religion, that idea that we're trying to reach God. Religion leads to idolatry. Idolatry leads to death. That's not what God has for us. Like, he doesn't want us to live in that type of frustration. He wants us to live an abundant life, a full life. Like, if 2021 is going to be all that we hope it can be, it means walking with him in life. See, if we go into Joel 2, we're going to get a picture of, of, as God speaks to his people who had wandered from him, really what he's after. Joel 2, it says, and by the way, this is like my favorite chapter of the entire Bible. Like, this is it. You want to light Mickey's fire? Sit me down with Joel 2 and let me meditate on what God's saying and calling his people to and the response that comes from it. Beautiful. And this is, this is part of it. God's calling us back to himself. He says, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. And he says, tear your heart, not merely your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in mercy, and relenting of catastrophe. Who knows? He might turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. Let me give a quick summary of what I'm reading here. God's saying to you, I'm not interested in all your religious activities. I'm not interested in what you show on the outside, that whole tearing of the garment would be an out, outward sign to other people that you're mourning. He said, I don't care about that. Give me your heart. Come to me with a broken heart. Mickey, don't just go through the motions of doing the things that I've called you to do. Don't just go through the motions of repentance. Return your heart to me. 
And when you do so, then, then you will experience my blessings. It's a sober reminder to me that God, even in the Old Testament, even during a time where the people were trying to earn the favor of God, they were trying to uphold the law and and to to be in that right relationship with God, even in the midst of this, God is saying, it's not that that I'm after. This was supposed to be an avenue of you and me connecting our hearts. And we find that all through the Old Testament. So here's the thing. It it then begs the question, if just doing the right things, if just adding prayer back in and, and, you know, making sure that we pray with our family before bed and that I'm waking up early in the morning to spend time with God, that I'm opening up his word, that I'm spending time in community, whatever that looks like, um, that I'm coming to worship. If just doing those things isn't good enough to really experience the blessings of God in 2021, what is? Like, what are those things we should do then? If it's not simple, if it's not stuff we can do, then what do we do? Well, I think Jesus answers that in John. He says this. He says, abide in me, and I'll abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Family, I'm going to be honest. This is a a difficult verse for me. To abide in Jesus? Like, that's the response? Like, in the context of, of this verse, I mean, that just means connection, dependency, a continuous connection with him. That is the gospel in a nutshell. Like, it's not, the gospel isn't some magic prayer that you prayed sometime 10 years ago. Like, that's not what saves you. That's not what leads to life. It wasn't if you were dunked in water or had sprinkled water when you were a baby. Those things don't lead to life. Those are just, again, things we do. Jesus is telling us the way we get life is just stay connected to him, to trust in him. That that I'm going to put all of my faith, I'm going to put all my eggs in one basket. And that's that his death, his burial, and his resurrection, that that's the only place that I find life. That there is nothing else I can do to make myself right with the Father. Like, that is the gospel. And the truth is, I struggle with that. I have to preach to myself every day, multiple times a day, that the gospel is enough, that Jesus is enough. Nothing needs to be added to what he's done. And to try to even do so lessens what he did. Jesus paid it all. And all I need to do to be made right with the Father and to maintain a right relationship with the Father, to walk in the fullness what God has for me in 2021, is to trust in that. That's it. There is nothing I can do or not do that will change that fact. That is is the pure gospel. And if you're watching this morning, and if you've been depending on anything else to make you right before the Father, to fix that brokenness between you and the creator of the universe, I'm going to say right now is the time, give it up. Just give it up. We can't do it. I can't do it. I have to remind myself, even if I get up and pray, Every morning. I could pray from morning till night. That action does not make things right between me and God. I can study my Bible relentlessly. Jesus even said 
to, to the Pharisees, you, you search and search and you read and read and you study and study, yet you don't even know me. They studied, they knew, and they missed that he was right there. And I think oftentimes in my life, I do the same thing. I get so busy with the religious activities, even as a pastor, that sometimes I miss just sitting back and resting in Christ. Like he says his burden is light. Why do I got to make the burden so heavy? Why can't I just walk with him? Why can't I just trust him? The truth is, all this religious activity, it doesn't have to be that. It could be a natural byproduct of what it means of resting in him. Like, these things I do, they can be because I'm his. Because I have a position with him, not to earn a position with him. So, here's why I struggle with this. Like, as I was unpacking this message and and in doing so, unpacking my own spiritual walk, I came to a reality. I like control. I like to think that I have it all together, that I can control my own destiny, that my actions, the things I do, that those will dictate whether good things or bad things happen to me, because I can control it. You know what abiding in Christ means? Giving up control. Like, Jesus... You have control. I am going to trust you with the control. So I'm going to share now a piece of scripture that I have to share with myself, where I draw encouragement from, because I know this is the tendency of my fallen nature to fall into this trying to earn God's favor, to earn my place with him. Because I know this is the way I'm built. I have to regularly speak scripture over myself. And I find myself doing that through this whole morning as I was preparing the message through the past few weeks as I realized that this is what I've been doing. This is a scripture that speaks volumes to me. So I'm going to invite you into it and unpack it a little bit. And it's found in Galatians 4. And the whole, the whole point of the book of Galatians is that Paul's ticked off. He's mad. Because there's a his church that he founded in, in they, they've, they knew the true gospel. They knew that there was nothing they could, do, they could do to earn the favor of God. But some false teachers have come aside and said, no, you have to uphold the law as well. And so they've put the burden of that back on themselves. And he's ticked off saying, you don't have to do that anymore. The whole book is about this whole concept we're, we're unpacking today. But this specific one really speaks to my heart in chapter 4. He says this, now, I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from the slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, we, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of this world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoptions as sons. And because you are sons, God has set forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. These are words of encouragement. Now, there's a couple things that I see in here that, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, that I want to unpack. The first is that we were in bondage without Christ. Now, that means we are bondage to sin, though that's not what this piece of Scripture is speaking of, but it's certainly true. Without Christ, we are, we are tied to sin. We cannot break that, 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 that chain by ourselves. Nothing we can do, no amount of good works can ever undo the sin that we already carry. Jesus breaks that. 
really what this scripture is speaking to is we, we're also slaves to the law of trying to, to earn that position with God, trying to be perfect, because that is, that's, that's what we're aiming for. Like, that's the only thing that makes us right before God is to be perfect, and we can't be. And so we were a slave to that, trying, trying to become something we could never attain but on our own. And we're slaves trying to work it out. But when the fullness of time has come, Jesus broke that chain as well. He was perfect. He lived out the law perfectly. And he died in our place, freeing us from both of those, both the sin and the needing to uphold something that we can't. And that speaks volumes to me. Like, that takes me so, like, just meditate on that, of who Jesus is and what he does for us. But the other piece, the other piece that jumps off the pages to me is this idea that I am adopted. Now, to understand that I was adopted means I also need to unpack that I was once a spiritual orphan. I had no inheritance. I had nothing to claim my own. I was a dirty street rat living by crumbs. But God, in his great mercy, nothing but his goodwill, he adopted me into his family through Christ. I am now an heir. Everything that you can think of that, that, that is good, I am now an heir to. I'm heir to eternity. I'm an heir to hope. And, and one of the things as I meditate on that truth is how foolish I must look when I try to earn my right to be adopted. Like, if I'm an orphan kid and I know that there's a family coming in to adopt me, so I go and I put on my best clothes, which are probably hand-me-downs. They're probably too big and have some stains. And my buddy gives me a haircut in the orphanage because I can't, I can't go to the barber. And I, and I get cleaned up. And, I, I, and before they come, I look in the mirror and I'm the best I've ever looked. Like, I'm ready. They're coming. And the family walks in the door to adopt me. And man, they come from royalty. They have rings on their fingers. They have tailored clothes, perfumes, makeup. And as good as I thought I looked, I now just look foolish in front of them. And they don't love me. They don't adopt me because of what I put on. They don't, because of this show that I tried to put on for them. They did it because they want to invite me into their family. They want to invite me to something new. They don't have to depend on those things anymore. They will dress me. They will put ring on my finger. They will give me a new name. And friends, when we try to dress up for Jesus, we look just as foolish. We can't do it. We can't do it. We can't measure up. So really what we do is just accept his love. Kylie watches this show. It's called Blue Bloods. don't know if you've ever watched it. If not, no big deal. But it's kind of a good show. I like it. Um, and in it, there's this family called the Reagan family, and, and they're New York cops, right? And in, in, in the show, every Sunday night, the family meets for dinner. Um, as a matter of fact, when I watched the last episode with her, they were talking about that no matter what happens, they meet for Sunday dinner. Like all the extended family come together, like grandkids, grandpa, you know, the whole nine yards, right? And they said even when grandpa had a heart attack, they brought Sunday dinner to him. They still had dinner as a family. And I think this is a beautiful picture of really what our spiritual disciplines look like because that, that coming together for the Reagan family, that coming together, it's a discipline. Like, it takes some sacrifice to show up every Sunday morning for a family dinner. And I'm sure there's times as a family they don't really feel like it, but they do. And they do, and they experience 
the good things that come with being part of that family. And so it's, it's also a privilege. While it's a discipline that takes sacrifice, it's a privilege, and it's part of what makes them a family. Like, it's part of what binds them together. This, this discipline they have binds them together. It unifies them. It drives them forward. It gives them the power to move forward in what is a very, you know, they're New York cops, a very difficult life. Well, guess what? We're a family, too. But we're not a make-believe family on TV. We're not New York cops. What we are is a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood. We are an army of God. And these things, when we come together, when we pray, when we study our Bible, when we come together in community, when we worship, this is just family dinner. It's just what we do as a family. It's a natural part of what we do. And so as I enter into 2021, I'm giving myself an invitation and I'm giving you an invitation as well. I just invite you to dinner. I invite you to dinner. But here's the thing. Just come as you are. Whatever burdens you carry from the week, whatever hurts you've come, please do not come to the table and just put on a show. Come as you are. Come and know that our relationship with the Father, that's what's going to make everything all right. Us abiding in Jesus, not whether we did good or bad this week, whether we checked the right boxes or not, but our ability to just trust in Jesus. That's what gives us a seat at the table. We don't have to earn it. Because of Jesus, we already have a seat at the table, so let's just come enjoy it and all the privileges that go with it. And yeah, it'll be a discipline sometimes. Sometimes it'll take sacrifice to show up to dinner. I get it. And if we miss a Sunday, man, don't beat yourself up. If you miss a Bible study, don't beat yourself up. Don't be like every other New Year's resolution where I ate, I just had some chips and now I blew my whole diet and so I'm just going to go off the bandwagon. No. Put the chips away. Go grab a carrot. Whatever. Do what you need to do just to get, get right back. Let's just maintain a healthy relationship with Jesus. What other relationship in your life is about checking the right boxes? If you screw up any other relationship in life, you just do what you can to mend that relationship. You just return to what's good. You ask for forgiveness and you move forward. Let's just do the same with Jesus, please. So as I wrap up in prayer, listen, don't know where you all are at spiritually this morning. I don't know what your 2020 has been like. You may even be hurting right now. Forget 2020. You're in a new year and you're wondering, is this year going to be any different? I'm going to say, I believe in the potential of today. I believe in the potential of tomorrow. Jesus has the power to raise you from the dead. I don't care how broken your heart is. Jesus has the power to heal it. But we're not going to do it apart from him. It's the abiding. So if you've been trying to earn your way, this morning I ask you stop, that you relent, that you give in, and just trust Jesus He has paid the price for you. And maybe this is the day that you get to experience new life. Again, it's not a magic prayer that saves you. It is this trusting in Jesus that saves you. And you can do that this morning. And for those of us that know Jesus, can we go into the new year, stop trying to earn his favor and just trust? Let's pray. Father God, I'd be lying if I said I don't hurt. Hurt because of my own failures. Hurt because of things around me. 
hurt watching my brother and sisters go through things. Even my own family this morning that I, I know is struggling. But Lord, I have faith that you, you plan only good things for those who love you good intentions, that you'll take even this bad and you'll use it for your good, that you're preparing us for something new. And Lord, I pray that we don't move so quickly to go back to normal that we miss what you have for us. And Lord, I pray that we stop trying to just check the right religious boxes, but we trust in who you are. We trust in you with this new year that we look to where you're moving, to look to where you're doing good, and we just align ourselves with that. that, that our prayer time, our worship, our study time is really just about connecting our hearts to you. There's not about anything else. And Lord, as we go into this time of worship and we go into this time of giving, I ask that it flow from this connection, flow from this trust. Lord, If we're giving this morning, may it be for glad hearts, of thankful hearts. Lord, as we're in our living rooms and the band begins to play, Lord, may we not just be spectators to your goodness. May we stand up with our family. May we worship. May we call your name and call you good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.